Hey everyone, welcome back to Clinical Physio with me, Khalid Maidan. In today's video, we're going to be taking you through why we test passive range of movement. But before we get into that, what is passive range of movement testing? Well, this is the situation where the therapist is performing movement tests on the patient whilst our patient is relaxed. Hence the term passive, because our patient is not joining in. And why do we bother testing passive range of movement? Well, because our patient is not joining in, these tests give us the opportunity to analyze any specific movement of any joint without active muscle interaction. For example, we could choose a specific movement such as elbow flexion. Now, because we are testing this passively, we can rule out the patient's active contractions of the biceps muscles, which would normally create the patient's elbow flexion. This allows us to examine other aspects of the joint being tested without the interference of the active muscles. So now we know what we are not testing, let's think about what we are testing. Well, we'll be testing the inert structures, which include the joint, as well as the capsule and the cartilage. We're also looking at ligaments, fascia, bursae, neural tissue, and muscles and tendons that are being passively stretched. Something we need to make very clear here, passive movement testing does not exclude muscles altogether it excludes the active contractile element of the muscles. For example, as we said with passive elbow flexion, we are excluding the active contraction of the biceps muscles, but we are including the lengthening of the triceps muscles in this movement, even though it is not contracting. So when we're completing passive range of movement testing, there are three key things we need to analyze. Pain, range, and end feel. And you will see us talking about pain range and end feel whenever you watch our videos on passive range of movement testing within the clinical physio catalogue. So let's start with pain. So why do we look for pain? We need to look for and reproduce pain during our tests to help us work out what is wrong with our patient. We are looking to see what pain the test elicits, where the pain was elicited, and also the severity and the nature of the pain elicited. In terms of the what and the where, we may consider if we can relate that pain into our patient's previously reported symptoms, or whether the pain corresponds with specific anatomical structures, for example, the biceps tendon or the sciatic nerve in the leg. In terms of the severity, we may question if the pain elicited was just a mild pull, for example, or an extremely sharp sensation. And the therapist would need to make a note of these things to compare in future sessions. Let's go through some examples to make sense of that. Let's take our patient Kim, who is complaining of a moderately sharp pain on the right patella tendon. When we test passive flexion of Kim's right knee, we find a moderately sharp pain is elicited in the region of the patella tendon. Now this could implicate the patella tendon as the irritated structure causing her symptoms. And this would confirm, in line with our subjective history, that the patella tendon is indeed irritated. And it also confirms to us that passive knee flexion is an irritable movement for Kim. Now let's take the example of Kim's patella tendon pain again, whereby she reports pain local to the patella tendon during the subjective history, just as in the previous discussion, However, on this occasion, when we test passive knee flexion, we find that she experiences a mild dull ache on the anterior right thigh and no pain in the patella tendon. Whilst this may tell us that the soft tissues of the right thigh may be irritated or tight, it does not implicate the patella tendon in its inert state as the source of patient's pain during knee flexion. This is because even though Kim reported pain at the patella tendon in her subjective history, the pain elicited in this particular test was in a different location and was in a different nature and severity compared to when we tested it before. So this means that we don't quite have enough data at this point to presume that the patella tendon is at fault, where in the previous example, we did. Next, onto range of movement. And why do we want to test range of movement? Well, too much or too little range at a particular joint could indicate a dysfunction within the movement pattern. 
or a limitation in range could be due to a mechanical restriction, such as a stiff joint capsule. Either way, as a therapist, it's always important for us to use the range of values in our movement tests as objective markers and for us to compare those values in each treatment session. When we're testing range of movement, it's important for us to note the range at which your patient's pain starts and the range at which their movement ends, as often these values can be different. If we only measured the movement at which pain started and didn't measure the point at which pain ended, then we actually don't know how much range our patient can achieve. Let's take an example to clarify this. Let's say our patient Ali, who is undergoing rehabilitation following a distal radius fracture, is here in our clinic, and we're measuring his range of passive wrist extension on the left side. We note that Ali complains of pain at approximately 10 degrees of wrist extension, which he describes as mild. With his consent, he agrees for us to take the movement further, as his pain is only mild, and we find that he can actually achieve 40 degrees of passive wrist extension. If we had stopped the movement at the point at which Ali's pain started, we would have thought he only had 10 degrees, and this would have been a marked deficit in comparison to last week's session when he had 20 degrees. However, because we took his total achievable range by taking the movement a little bit further, we have now found that his range of movement has actually improved since his session last time. Next, on to end feel. And what is end feel? End feel is a soft 5 to 10 degree oscillating movement performed at the very end of available range during passive range of movement testing. And it's interpreted by the specific sensation felt through the therapist's hands during the movement. End feel can be classified as different things. It can be classified as hard, which is where bony tissue stops movement, soft, when soft tissue stops movement, elastic, which is where inert elastic structures, such as a ligament, stops movement, springy, which is where there is a sense of recoil, because when you take the movement to the end of range, it cannot stay there, and instead it bounces back. And this is often because there is a structure such as a loose body which is preventing further movement. An enfeel can also be described as empty, which is when the therapist cannot go to the end of range because the patient stops them due to increased pain, or perhaps if the patient is guarding. Springy or empty enfeels are always considered to be abnormal enfeels, whereas hard, soft or elastic enfeels are normal to be found at the end of range depending on the joint and the movement being tested. So for example, the expected end feel for passive knee flexion is soft, as it is soft tissue structures which prevent further movement during knee flexion. However, in the presence of pathology, such as let's say osteoarthritis of the knee, we may find we have a hard end feel when we're, when we're testing passive range of movement in terms of knee flexion. And so whilst a hard end feel can be a normal end feel in general, it is an abnormal end feel for the particular movement of passive knee flexion which we're testing. Just to bear in mind, empty feel could be due to non-sinister pain or apprehension on the patient's part. However, empty feel in some quarters can be associated with serious pathology such as a fracture when patients simply find even slight movements very painful. And that completes our video on why we test passive range of movement. We'd like to suggest that you also have a look at our video titled Why We Test Active Range of Movement so that you can compare your movement testing options. Thank you as always for watching everyone and we'll see you again soon right here on Clinical Physio.